Sidney Smith has illustrated numerous acclaimed children's books, including Town is by the Sea, written by Joanne Schwartz, and the wordless picture book Sidewalk Flowers, conceived by John Arno Lawson, which won the Governor General's Award, among many other honors. He has received the New York Times Best Illustrated Children's Book Award three times. Now, I'm corrected, four times. Is that that's with the book we're going to talk about right yeah. now? Yeah, the book we're going to talk about right now is called uh, Small in the City, which has also won the Governor General's Award. That's right. Uh, which is why we're here in Ottawa together. He lives and works in Halifax with his wife and children. Welcome to the Bibliophile. Thank you. I'm going to uh, lay some quotes on you to try and to try and, and if we could riff off those. Okay, sure. To, they're, they're my quotes. No, they're not your quotes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you can you can come up with your quotes. Oh, okay, okay. Because sometimes I say some really silly things and people people <laughs> well, ask they, me about they, it. They catch you on them. I yeah, try to. Yeah. Okay. No, I, what I want to do is, is riff off these to get a, a, try to get a handle on what you do so well. Okay, sure, yeah. So, now this, I don't know what this is going to elicit. It's just a short little poem by G.K. Chesterton mm-hmm. that he wrote in a Randolph Caldecott picture book that he presented to a young friend. And it goes... This is the sort of book we like, for you and I are very small. With pictures stuck in anyhow, and hardly any words at all. You will not understand a word of all the words, including mine. Never you trouble, you can see, and all directness is divine. Stand up and keep your childishness. Read all the pedances, screeds, and strictures, but don't believe in anything that can't be told in colored pictures. Ah, that's interesting. I like that. I like that last line especially. I thought a lot about the role of illustration, and uh, you know, Caldecott is the the name of the big American award, which of which I'm not eligible. So oh, you have to be American. <laughs> you idiot. have to be a resident or a citizen. Yeah, yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, because he's a he's British. I know he's British, so but what the hell? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's. it's and they thing. opened up the Booker to Americans. You'd think it's the least they could do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Return the favor to the Commonwealth. I think every year there's a there's a conversation of why is it only Americans? But in, anyway, well. Canadians have the Governor General's Award. That's yeah. A, well, we're very happy with that. It's a it's a wonderful honor. But that poem made me think a little bit about the role of illustration, which I've been thinking about quite a bit lately. Is that when when you present a reader with two different versions of the story, different where they conflict. Yeah. So in like Time Was by the Sea or in Small in the City, or in other books, there's this this moment of counterpoint where you see one thing, but you're told a different thing. The reader looks at the illustration for the truth. First. First. Yeah. And from there on is the reality. Never the flip, never the flip, never where hmm. the illustration presents a different version and the text is reality. You, you never see that. And I when I thought about that, it gave me... The sense of of power as the illustrator, you yeah. have the power to change a manuscript, to change a story, to be understood in a different way. So you to can be, create an unreliable the, narrator right. just with one image. Because you, the, you take precedence over the author. Is that what you're saying? You, you can, you can. But is this <laughs> is this some sort of scientifically proven fact? Like it's this is how your brain and your eyes work. Where'd they get that from? I, I, I got it from my own experience. This is only, 
only through trial. So this is your experience with readers my... of your book. Yeah. Books. Yeah, and it's just part of what you do when you're writing and illustrating is anticipating how people follow the story. And so when you're pacing the story, you, you think about the page turns, the rhythm of the text, and the certain moments that really require punctuation and that's punctuation with an image can be a wordless image can be a space just to let words resound a little bit like a ringing bell where you, you can stop and you can create you, you can create so much with illustrations beyond just the pictures of of the text one other thing i love yeah. about that is at the yeah. beginning when he talks about us yes we are small we are small yeah we are small. And I think that's a huge part of my thinking towards these books. It's not, it's not me, an adult, telling a child what it is like to be a child. Yeah. It's, which is Or what to think. Or what to think. Yeah, exactly. This is your experience. Nobody likes that. Nobody would ever like someone who's not them telling them what it's like. Yeah. So instead, talk to another human about the human experience. This is, this is like a universal theme of heartbreak, of, of feeling separation from someone you love. That's not something that is telling a child what it's like to be a, a child. It's telling, you know, it's talking to another human. So it's about us. It's about us. you talking about the experience of an adult and a child reading a book. I'm talking about my book. Your book specifically. specifically because yeah. it's about feeling... Uh, so it's about heartbreak a little bit, you know, grief. Uh, it's about, well, it, uh, here, I'm not going to tell you what your book's about, but I, a, I read a, it. Yeah, sure, you uh, tell me. It, what I found really interesting was it was about something different than what I initially thought it was going to be about. Right. It's not tragic. No. There's a possibility that it could be tragic. Yeah, yeah. It's a safe place to explore the feeling of tragedy. It's a safe place to explore a feeling of grief or yeah. processing complex emotions. And, and you might want to follow this book up with a happier book before you turn out the lights, but... It's not unhappy, though. It's not We're unhappy. Not, it doesn't, <laughs> it's up in the air, isn't it? it? It is. It's up in the air. I should give it more credit. But um, <laughs> I guess it represents a lot to me because I've, I've attached... A loss of a friend to this book and I am you know I'm lamenting the you know I, I moved away from Toronto so I'm, I'm missing that neighborhood it's a quiet book it's it's a serious one but that 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 element of it being one thing turning out to be another mm -hmm. is important and and that something that I really tried to tried to set up even through the title, Small in the City. Small in the City sounds like any other book about being a kid in the city. And it starts off with the words, I know what it's like to be small in the city, which is almost this kind of arrogant, like it is, it, it does sound like me, the author, telling a kid what it's like to be a kid. I know what it's like to be small in the city. So I, I like I like that you, you go in anticipating something and then you're hit with the Mack truck of emotion. <laughs> You're disarmed, and mm. that's basically what, that's one way to tell a good story is to establish a language th through repeti repetition. The reader builds up this expectation, and then all of a sudden it's flipped on them. Well, th this brings up a bunch of different quotes here that I'm going to bring in. Uh, or at, le at least it it, uh, it jives with what uh, a number of different people are saying about the art of illustrating children's books. Let's go on to what Maurice Sendak said about Caldecott's work. Uh -huh. He said that it heralds the beginning of the modern picture book. He devised an, an ingenious juxtaposition of picture and word, a counterpoint that never happened before. Yeah. Words are left out, but the picture says it. Yeah. Pictures are left out, but the word says it. Mm -hmm. And here's what jives with what we just said, I think. Mm -hmm. 
You can't say it's a tragedy, but something hurts, like a shadow passing quickly over. It is this which gives a Caldecott book, however frothy the verses and pictures, its unexpected depth. I think that captures your book almost exactly. Yeah, well, counterpoint is something that I think is really interesting because he talks about it with with Randolph Caldecott, but also Sendak is known for for his. I mean, what did he call him? Heralding a new age of uh, beginning of the modern picture book. Beginning, but that that people credit Sendak for that this very same thing. The use of counterpoint within ch children's books is a really interesting thing. It requires a lot of faith in the reader. It's a challenge towards the reader to create a deeper understanding. Because you give them pieces, you give them clues, and they put it together and they understand. Okay, if you read the book, if you read the text of my book, I'm, I'm using my book because I, right now because it's right in front of us. Sure. And it's got a beautiful cover of, I should say, this little, I'm guessing it's a boy, but it could be a girl. Yeah, sure. I tend to say boy, but only yeah. just uh, because I identify with the character. And that eye that you've done there is incredible. It's a bit crispy. <laughs> it's in, no, no, it's incredible because it's got so much emotion in it. It's like he's kind of going backward a little bit. He might be a little bit nervous, or oh. but he is also confident at the same time. It's it's a very interesting, beautiful. That's interesting because that's chapter. kind of how I like to think of the characters. Mm. It, I wanted there to be a really confident voice. But they're, they're underneath all of that is a nervousness. Yeah, that's exactly what... Uh, just just in that that one eye there. But you've also got the mouth sort of underneath the scarf. Yeah, I, 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 with this book, more than any other book, I've hidden the face quite a bit. Or just left it blank. Yeah. And Why'd you do that? I think I, think I like it because uh, an expression can be too much. It's a bit manipulative. You see a smile, you have to you say, "Oh, that kid's happy." You see a frown, "Oh, that kid's sad." Mm -hmm. You leave it blank, you project. It's uh, like an avatar for you. Well, several things you've said talk about the involvement of the reader in your book. Yeah, and yeah, that's what you're after. Obviously. Exactly. I well, I believe that if you have faith in the ability for your reader to follow along and actively read actively read yeah and think and, and, and think and process and, project yeah yeah empathize yeah. empathy is really at the at the at the core of a lot of it then the experience is the most rewarding i think for the reader because mm -hmm. they get they get something out of it they they have this feeling of accomplishment when it's done there's a risk there of course that you could be too obscure and lose your lose your reader altogether mm -hmm. or you, or you could be accused of being self-indulgent I wouldn't. <laughs> if someone called me self-indulgent, then I would have to agree because it's it's kind of what you're asked to do when you're making a book. You're by yourself. You're putting in as much as you can into a book. Every last ounce of creativity, of last drop of ink, last pigment of paint that you can put into it. Yeah, I'm going to be self-indulgent. <laughs> Who is uh, Sheila Berry? Uh, Sheila Berry was the editor at Groundwood Books, and she contacted me, how many years ago would that be? Five years ago. Five years ago. Six years ago. When I was in Halifax, I was moving to Toronto with my wife, because my wife was going to school at Ryerson. She was going to do early childhood education, masters of, of, of ECE. And... I had no idea what I was going to do. I was going to be a barista. I was going to work at a bookstore. I, I, I don't know. I wasn't sure. Still going to work on kids' books, but I mean, I wasn't making a, a, a living out of it in you Halifax. You went to NASCAD, right? I went to NASCAD, yeah. We, a week before we moved, I get an email from Sheila Berry saying, do you want to work on this book? And she, I've never talked to her before. She's from Groundwood Books. Groundwood represents quality in Canada, in the world. Yeah. North America. It, and this it, was pure coincidence? It was pure cold call. Like she just, out of the blue. I don't know how much of a coincidence. Oh, it was a coincidence that I was moving there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She had no idea. She said, do you want to do this wordless book? And 
No. And I got that. I remember I got. A, I looked at the email on my cell phone, <laughs> and I, I whooped, and I did this kind of dance out on the. I was on the sidewalk talking to my friends, and I hurt my back because I jumped too high, and I, oh, and they were like, "What's going on?" <laughs> and I and I showed them. It was such a like a, just a perfect perfect thing to have happened because that book was Sidewalk Flowers. And now, did she does she scout? the schools for talent is that like she must have um, heard what, about you somehow no it, well yeah she heard about me uh she'd seen a couple of my my sherry fitch books and what's that oh sherry fitch is a maritime writer uh, i mean she's a canadian legend of a <laughs> author <laughs> but she's from the maritimes right and she's a nonsense poet children's poet she writes YA, she writes adult uh, work, but mostly she's known for her kids' poetry books. But anyway, yeah, I had done a few books before. I had done a little bit of uh, illustration for the Globe and Mail, and then she had seen my work in the Globe and Mail, so she cut out something. She, what did she you do for the Globe and Mail? I did some opinion, the facts and arguments page. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I did a couple of those. They give that job to unknown illustrators all the time which is great it's yeah. a good way to get exposure and that's how I, yeah. I was noticed it worked it worked unfortunately they didn't pay me for some of that but anyway it's a different story the Globe and Mail didn't pay you <laughs> it was a long time ago and it was during this big shift in their ownership all of a sudden there was the people who were working there weren't working there and they didn't get paid you it was send a long time did ago. you send them a couple bills I did. I sent them a, a couple bills. They asked me if I wanted to do some more illustrations, and I said, "Well, you have to pay me first. And then I didn't hear from them. So. <laughs> okay. Anyway, it's not a big deal. I don't know if anyone from there is listening. I don't. Yeah, I don't. They should be. Yeah, no. If they are, it was it was a anyway, long time ago. Yeah. I anyway, think it just yeah. kind of get lost in the. Yeah. At least it worked for you. It did a job, and then from there, Sheila Berry, public uh, edited Sidewalk Flowers, which boosted my career, gave me so much exposure before that I hadn't even received a review and then I was in the New York Times Best Illustrated I won a Governor General's Award the book was in 16 different regions published wow. all around the world John Arno Lawson the author I never give him enough shout outs and credits but he's the author of this book yeah. quite often because it's a wordless book he, he doesn't get he doesn't get enough attention for it. So it's a wordless book, but it was the storyline was his. Yes, it was a very personal story though that he had experienced with his own child. Okay. Uh, but then from there it was the White Cat and the Monk, which was also a New York Times Best Illustrated. And then Town is by the Sea, which it's when I heard about you. Yeah, good because that's one of my favorites with Joanne Schwartz, uh, amazing author. And then from there, uh, Small in the City. Now Sheila was sick when I was uh, writing Small in the City. But she was, it was never, it was never, it was always assumed that she would recover. She would never talk about it, things in terms of, you know, in any final terms. Cancer? Uh, yeah, complications from cancer. It was like pneumonia, I think, at the end. But, you know, we were always talking about, oh yeah, when you get back, I'll, I'll be able to help you around the house and stuff like that. She was a mentor in many ways and encouraged me to, to really... Uh, take risks and follow, follow a vision. So, what does that mean? Take risks and follow a vision. What does that mean? Well, it really, ultimately, what it means is don't don't follow what you think other people want you to do. She never told me what to do, and for the longest time, I I worked in a way that I thought editors wanted me to work, or readers wanted me to work, or other illustrators. You know, you start thinking about what's in in style. What's what's. Yeah. Yeah, you're influenced obviously by others. Yeah, you're influenced by others, but you also see what's working with other people, so you do you throw some of that in there. Yeah. But then it becomes just derivative. It becomes you're just basically limiting yourself. You can't mm. you can't reach personal heights if you're yeah. just trying to work in other people's terms. So what does that again? What does that mean? You listen to your own imagination. You you yeah, you, yeah. you had ideas coming into your head that you said. Uh, you're not going to try and filter them or yeah. or adjust them to you. You're going with your pure imagination. Instincts, I guess. You start thinking about what it is it that you you want to see, not stuff that you've seen. What is it the thing that you, you've never seen but you've always wanted to see? And then when you can start, when you can start listening to that. That's the good stuff right there. That's a lovely little mug with some little red flowers you've got. 
right. on this dedication page. So the mug, the mug is we always got together and had tea or, or coffee. And the flowers are from the last page. That last page of... Of the book? Of the book, yeah. yeah. The last page is, is a spread of the, the main character and his mother. and So it's, it's a little bit about home. And, and throughout the book, I use that red yeah as a theme and it's always it's always with traffic and it's always with stoplights and it's always with a different feeling but at the end it, it's about home so uh i don't know see there there like i get i get really into i get really into it you know you're sitting by yourself for a long time painting these things for hours and hours and no, thousands, thousands they're... of hours you start getting really really into the into what what things mean and why why are you, why am i doing this why am I doing it like this? I, I must say, the first spread, it, it is quite dark. There's a silhouette of, of him in the, in the bus. But outside, it, it, it could be, uh, you know, I'm thinking of 1930s Germany is what I was thinking of. <laughs> oh, really? It's yeah, yeah. like, uh, this is, this looks kind of bleak. Oh, yeah, I suppose, yeah. Uh, it's, they're beautifully done. They're very evocative, but... It looks, yeah, kind sort of, of barren face, and faceless figures. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then it and then it sharpens up and gets clearer. Well, but, uh, there's a few things I wanted to do with that first spread. One is kind of do have an introduction similar, uh, in, in a sort of cinematic way, starting with the detail and, and panning out. Yeah, yeah. And then you start without being too descriptive, so you get more. You you, you introduce with the feeling. Mm. The feeling is that you're looking through a, a window, but you're not focusing on anything so that's right you're kind of uh, in a, not in a trance but kind of maybe caught up in your own thoughts exactly okay let's uh, I just want to quote and again I was kind of caught up on Caldecott I want to just find a final quote about him from the art critic Gleason White who said that Caldecott was able to express himself with rare facility in pictures in place of words, so that his comments upon a simple text reveal endless subtleties of thought. You have but to turn to any of his toy books to see that at times each word, almost each syllable, inspired its own picture. He studied his subject as no one else ever studied it, then he portrayed it simply and with inimitable vigor, with a fine economy of line and color. When color is added, it is mainly as a gay convention and not closely imitative of nature. And again, I thought that your use of color wasn't necessarily imitative of nature, but it's it, the red really does stand out, doesn't it? I mean, it's yeah, you know what it is. Yeah, it's a it's traffic light or it's the tail lights of a car, but right. Well, I thought about it a lot. Um, I think I worked backwards with that because that's the kind of the last thing you see in the city in a snowstorm. The buildings disappear, the cars, the people disappear, but those tail lights of cars still burn through all of that snow all of the abstraction and so you build backwards from that and you include it in each page as a theme yeah but, why did you do that well I, I thought i thought it evoked that feeling of being kind of in the middle of a a, a snowstorm and yeah. also i just i i like those highlights i don't know i like a, a, a color theme but i like the the highlights Mostly, I use a pretty muted palette, and then you just balance it out with a hit of of, of red here and there. You yeah, his little pom pom is not quite as bright a no, red. But yeah, it's a little bit of a dusty rose. You know, we talked about the audience for these types of books, children's illustrated books, and you have to grab and entice and intrigue the parent. To buy it, yeah, yeah. With with what the color, the story, what? Hmm. I don't know. I I'm I'm not I'm not really sure. I don't really think. I try not to think about it too much. I try not to think about other people too much. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to leave out the kids. 
But you start thinking about kids too much, then you, it, it, you get caught up in what you think kids yeah. want to see and how they're different than us when that's not the truth. With parents, it's like you can get caught up with what you think they want to see child, children to be. And that gets to be tough as well because, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure. I mean, I guess what you want to do is, if it, and I'm not really sure of the experience, it's been quite a while since I bought uh, books for my daughters, but you want the story to be one that the parent really would love to tell their kids. Well, as a, as a parent myself, I have a three and a half year old, we're really getting into books. I recognize in myself that like, I, I have favorites. I have favorites, you know. If I'm going to read them, I'm going to start pulling those from. Because you don't want to be bored. You want to exactly. Yeah. Frog and Toad. I'll read those till the the cows come home. <laughs> right. But what about Good Night Moon? Is that uh... Good Night Moon is is a great great book. Great book. I love it. I love it. Mm. Some people are weirded out by that old woman in the corner, but <laughs> mm. I I I like her. But um, but there are other books that are just like. You know, my kid's drawn to, but for different reasons. I'll read them. I'll read them for sure. But you, it's true. You do think about the parent because they're part of they're part of it. You know. Yeah. You're 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 creating a moment between mm. two people. A very special. Moment. A very special moment. And if you can reach both of them, why not? I mean, this is not this is they call them kids books, but they should be parents and kids books. Or teacher and kids book, you know, it's just it's a moment. It's a moment where you, you, that you create that two people share, and if you, both people can enjoy it, both people could have fun or or discover, or be surprised. It's a moment that they share together. It's yeah. not you're just reading at your kid. You're reading with your kid. And as you say, I, I suppose you want kind of an emotionally resonant experience for them too like if it's as you said it's a it's an environment within which a child can experience fear yes safely yeah exactly and i think a lot of the books that i was drawn to when i was a kid and i think a lot of other people as well are the ones where you are kind of scared a little bit you you're not sure about what that feeling is and you put it down and then you go back to it and you kind of you, you sort of dip into it a little bit, and you're like, uh, "What? What is this feeling that I'm feeling here? And why am I scared? Or why am I? Why do I feel uncomfortable? Mm -hmm. Who is that old woman in the corner? Yeah. <laughs> Those are the books that you go back to, and, yeah. and uh, well, they also, if the if the child is feeling fear for a, for a variety of different reasons that they don't understand, yeah, this is a way for them to express it or get it out, or yeah, recognize um, it, and later in real life applications. Yeah. Use it. I mean, you, yeah. you're you're developing tools to to process emotions. Yeah. And what better way than to do it through picture books, and then have be able to to recognize this is the feeling I'm feeling right now when it happens in real life because you know those things happen in real life. It's not all it's not going to be great. So when it does happen, you're yeah. not. Blown over. Blown over, yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And with kids, I mean, not to generalize, but I, I, think it's, I think it's pretty true that their spectrum of emotion is pretty raw. They, they don't have the tools to compartmentalize or to label or put those things aside and feel them later, you know? Yeah. I have that, and that's, it's, that's just rough, <laughs> you know? All of a sudden feeling an emotion that you should have felt a year ago, you know? This is it's hard as a uh, as a kid to to walk through your life and process these things on the spot and not know what they are. Well, as you say too, it's like it's a way for the parent to to help educate, socialize, or acclimatize the child to the real world. Yeah, yeah, without any real world consequences. Yeah. Now you've experienced illustrating with an author uh -huh. and now you've written your own and illustrated your own yeah uh, what's the difference after I wrote that I was wondering if I was going to go back to illustrating for other people because as an author illustrator you 
are able to do what I did at that time uh, with my book, which is to write the write the story visually and and textually at the same time. So you you can set up these moments where the image tells a story or the words inform the, your understanding. And quite often when you are given a manuscript as an illustrator, the book's done. The story's done. There's not much room for you to do anything, to act uh, in any way as a storyteller. You're there as, as ornament. Doesn't that depend on the relationship with that specific author, though? No, well, that's the thing is, I mean, I mean, definitely if you're working one-on-one -on -one with, a, with an author during the conception of the story, but as a... But once as it's it usually done, happens, it, it's given it's to you given as to you, complete but, manuscript. Right, and I and, guess they say, don't. I don't want you changing anything. Well, it's assumed. You don't change the text. You don't change the text, but then you either illustrate the text or you come up with some interesting other possibilities. Definitely, you can, you can come up with some other, possibil other possibilities for text. Or just Not for the way text. the, no, the story to be, to be read. Your image might... Yeah, inform it. In inform it, but it might also contradict it. Yeah. It might also... Uh, yeah, and that's where it's a lot of fun. But make a lot it of times, funny, make it sad, you know. It's, yeah, that's the beauty of illustration. But a lot of times, manuscripts will not have much room for that. Okay. The best texts that I've received had lots of room for that, where you have one simple narrative and then you are able to apply a subtext you can put subtext over subtext on top of all of that and it's uh that's where i that's what i really love yeah collaborating collaborating in those niches but when you're writing you can do it at the same time and you can tell yourself no I'm, take those words out because at, at this point the the illustration is going to to change take things, over yeah. take over that being said you can't come up by yourself, I can't come up with some of the results that I've come up with through collaboration because it's all about problem solving. And when you're problem solving, you're, you're constantly thinking outside of yourself. You're using whatever someone else has, has brought you and you're creating something that is something new. That's not you, it's not them, it's something new. Yeah. And you can't, I, I have a hard time doing that with my own work because it's so much of it is, it's it's kind of like this, there's this feedback, your loop, you know, you're just mm -hmm. like working with your own stuff and you hear, yeah. you hear in your own voice and you get nothing new. So what do you prefer? Or you love them both? I love them both for different reasons. I, I think I got to write a few more of my own books too. Maybe it'll just come easier next time. It hasn't so far, but. It's more lucrative to do that, I guess. We'll see. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the GG. Yeah. It's definitely more lucrative to not share it. But yeah. Uh, yeah. I want to quote now a Canadian, a great Canadian uh, book designer, but he may well be remembered most for being the illustrator of Alligator Pie. Frank, uh, whose author is Dennis Lee. Dennis Lee and Dennis Lee. I asked him personally. I met him at a book festival, and I asked him when I was working on this book. I, and I was working on a lecture about this my book. I asked him, you know, what what is it about what is it about scary books? Because Alligator Pie is a scary book. You've got body parts hanging. You, the the illustrator of that uh, of that book, Frank Neufeld. Yeah, amazing, amazing work, but unsettling. Yeah, and, and their and, relationship and, was unsettled too. Was it interesting? Yeah. And but Dennis, his 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 reply was was that it's a safe it's a safe place to to explore those feelings. Yeah. It was a very simple answer, but it was exactly right. Well, here's what Frank has to say about book illustrating. Of course, the visual should never be a rival of the originating manuscript, nor undermine or compete, but neither should the visual be asked to be subservient and know its place. That could just make the visual observation superfluous. If simply to justify its existence, the visual really ought to be expected to contribute beyond being a repetitious space eater. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I think that's something that any, any illustrator comes to in the, their own personal or growth as, as an illustrator is it 
you it, it's not about making the most prettiest pictures you can or or it's not about you making your mark as an illustrator it's about what you can do for the book it's the resulting story that proves whether you've done good illustrations or not uh, that that's a bit clunky but you you know what i mean like mm. it's it's about it's about the book it's not about you as as a, as an artist mm -hmm. do you want to get into the storyline at all of the book or should we just leave it that it's uh, the experience of a young boy going into a city on his own and then reuniting with his mom uh yeah you can uh we can i'm i was uh a bit hesitant to talk about the twist in the book but i feel like it's been read enough and people have been spoiling it all over the place from the very beginning so even my own publishers have been like check out this story about a cat <laughs> it's like oh God, what are you doing really you're taking yeah. it you're taking it. yeah I, I don't want to spoil it i think it's uh it's it's beautifully done though and it's oh uh, god there's something in this picture i wish i had done though uh this is the well maybe this the second edition uh, that will you can have it done in what's that the snow this is just a visual thing the snow sure. appears white here mm -hmm. should appear dark in front of the window ah, yeah because uh, of the beginning that doesn't light. bother me at all it doesn't but it's an opportunity just to 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 do something that i should have picked up on mm. but that's the thing. So you're done. You're done. When you're done, you're done, and yeah. you got to move on. And when I finished this book, I don't know if I was felt like completely satisfied, but mm -hmm. I think that's only because it was it was mine. Well, that's a good space to be in. You don't want to be completely satisfied. No, no. And you you take what you learned from one project and you apply it to another. And I like the idea that if you took all of my books, I think this is the same for everybody, but you take all of someone's books and you line them up you can see the connections between each one you can mm. see how one elements of one book like mm -hmm. this kind of soft in the background kind of a, yeah you got buildings some, in the background then you have this really sort of out of focus loose, out of focus yeah. same as at the beginning of the book you get this loose and out of focus that's something i play around with a lot in the next book it wasn't in the first it wasn't in the one before this but it's a just a theme that mm. kind of leapfrogs into another into another project. Well, that speaks to the collector in me. Yeah. That, uh, we need to get all of your books to see uh, the progression. Oh, yeah, and to see the progression. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Don't collect kids' books, though, but that's a lovely thing to collect. Mm. Oh, I'm, I'm into collecting kids' books. I have had to I had, had to put a, a bit of a pause on that. Cause <laughs> yeah, I can, you can get you know what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah, I've got a storage, uh, storage unit that knows what you're talking about. Uh-huh. Uh, I, I must say, I guess the word that really comes to mind looking at your your work, your images, paintings, is striking, really striking. Like the snowstorm, it's, it feels like you're right in the middle of a, st a snowstorm. Mm. I looked at a lot of uh, street photographers when I was working on this book. I saw, saw a leader or lighter, I don't know. How to, he, yeah. was, he was very inspiring. I took a lot of photos too in Toronto mm -hmm. with a film, a film camera. Yeah, how does uh, moving to Halifax, how do you think that's going to affect your actual work, if at all? I think because I'm moving back to such a familiar place, the stories are uh, the stories are going to be a lot more personal, I think. Since I've already started working on something that is really personal, I'm not even I'm not even sure if I want it to. I don't know. Give me divulging personal Yeah, it's just really based on my own my own childhood. I wanted to tell a story about a family that falls apart or separates or changes yeah. just a changing a family that changes but it, it it's not so unusual it's case. not so unusual and it, but I, it's still painful it's still painful but also i wanted to kind of tell it tell it in a, in a very neutral way in a way that is not didactic or in a way that's not overly sentimental it's when i experienced it i was young and it was just that's life that's the that's what's happening I didn't know the details, but it was just sort of, this is something that's happening in my life. And so what was more important than my my experience of it was, was watching my parents go through it. And that is a really, I think, maybe the most powerful thing about it is hmm. is how kids, when they're in a, in a situation... How they cope? Uh, well, how they cope, but also, you know, there's a study done where 
the first thing that kids do when they're in the hospital, the, first, the thing that they worry about the most is, is not how they're doing. It's how their parents are doing. That's their main concern? That's their main concern. And I believe that, that that's common throughout other elements of, mm. of when you see your parents going through something. Well, when you see them in distress or crying, it's very disturbing, isn't it? Yeah. For the child. Exactly. And so you, th there you have another moment of the child parent where it's like the child taking on the responsibility of taking care of, of someone else or yeah. taking care of the parent. Well, it's a really impressive uh, piece of work. Thanks. And uh, you're going to stick with Groundwood, I guess, are you? Well, that's a complicated affair. Groundwood publishes this in uh, Canada. Yes. Uh, Holiday House. This is a Neil Porter book in the States and has world rights. The Holiday House has, has, Neil, has uh, world rights. Except for Canada. Except for Canada. That was part of the deal. I really wanted this book to be with the other books at Groundwood. Yeah. Um, yeah. In Canada, and it it's very important to me. And it was hard to do that because I felt quite loyal to Groundwood, but I also had the blessing of Sheila before she passed away. She's you know that it's important to explore other markets, and I wanted to see what it was like working with Neil Porter. Neil Porter is a is like a, a bit of a legend in the children's book world. He's an editor that's been around for a long time. He's he he would never say it about himself, but he, you know he he's in the canon. He's responsible. He's behind a lot of amazing work, and so working with him has been a really good experience. And to what? How was it such a good experience? Um. Uh, I think I think he he like Sheila has has the ability to really trust you know encourage you to trust your your own decisions I mean he has he holds you to them like, mm -hmm. why are you doing this what is the reason that this is so are they they both editing your work or yeah oh no Sheila wasn't no Sheila wasn't Groundwood bought the rights the Canadian From, rights I understand okay so what did he add that uh, that, that wasn't there before not much uh, there was like a gloss this gloss this uh, gloss Neil I'm saying yeah he he might listen to this. I know, I know. I'm just I'm I'm kind of half joking. He was he was the sounding board for a lot of the final work, but I presented a pretty polished book dummy to him. Okay. So it was pretty complete when I gave it to him. I wanted it to be like that. I I uh, I didn't want to develop the story and the images with you, someone else because I needed to know what was mine. This is my first book I'm writing. I sure. wanted to know. You did it all on your own. Yeah. So what do you think he can add then in the future? Uh, well, I, I, I worked on another book with him after this one. It's not out till next year. And it's yours you wrote and illustrated? No, this one's written by Jordan Scott, who's a, who's a poet from the West Coast. Yes, I, did, I think I saw a short video that you did to talking about that. Oh, yeah? Okay. So this one's called I Talk Like a River. And it's really interesting. Did you find Jordan or no? No, Neil did. Neil did. Neil did, and he, and, uh, he asked me if I wanted to work on it. And uh, Canadian connection. There's a Canadian connection there, yeah, for sure. But opposite sides. Okay. Oh, we're full. Oh, it's you okay. still got others going. Yeah, <laughs> but it's Jordan's story, so it's really it's it's there's a universal element to the book, but it's very specific about his experience. Growing up with a stutter. Oh, interesting. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And um, being mm. able to work with that visually, I, Neil's role was to encourage experimentation, and he he's just an open-minded guy. So, we well, found, plus the fact that he put you together is pretty key, isn't it? Yeah, I guess their editors are matchmakers. Yeah. yeah. They see the potential. Mm. So, have you gone out west to meet him or no? No, I uh, Jordan met. Uh, I met him in Toronto. He was a, receiving a poetry award. Okay. And we sat down and talked for a while before I started really getting into the book. He's an amazing guy. Why is he so amazing? He's just one of those guys that's really. He's just super honest. True blue kind of. You sit down. He's very humble. Nice to talk to. Yeah. Sorry, boy. I'm a mate. Just checking the the lights, everything around. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Thanks. So it seems to be alright. Okay, thanks. All right. yeah. thanks.
I might leave that in there because <laughs> that accent was sweet. Yeah, I check um, the lights. <laughs> so anyway, he's a he's straightforward, honest. Uh, you felt that there was a, a there's a connection. connection. I feel like yeah, yeah, yeah I feel yeah. I feel connection. That makes that makes a difference. I assume. Yeah. Oh, definitely. You like him. That means you want to do good work for him, I guess. You, not that you wouldn't anyway, but... It kind of... That's sort of at the root of, of how I work. Not everyone works like that, I'm sure, but... I have told editors this before I've worked with, that, like, you want the best work out of me? Let's sit down and have coffee. We connect on a personal level. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work my ass off for you. Right. And that's how it's worked with Sheila. We connected on a personal level. Neil and I, we connect. And that just means that I am going to I'm going to climb a mountain for you, and uh, unfortunately, some editors don't even get what it. respect you enough to spend time with you to get to know you. Is that it? It's not it. It's about sharing and excitement. It's feeling that someone sh like sees what you're seeing yeah. and is yeah. really excited about a project. Yeah, that excitement is infectious and and snowballs. Yeah. You know, when you know that someone else is, can't wait to see what you're doing. Mm. And and then you feel like, kind of like a giddiness about about a project. That's what you kind of miss when you're working with really huge publishers. Is that is that that personal relationship? Some people can work like that, and and, and that's great. That's great. It's 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 good. But my agent probably hates it because <laughs> she's like, here's a here's a deal that's got a lot of money behind it, but. But then I'm like, hey, but I want to work with this little tiny publisher yeah. here, <laughs> right. who are, who are a bunch who, of really nice guys. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> who dig what I'm doing? Yeah, who really dig what I'm doing? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, that's great. I appreciate you bringing uh, bringing enthusiasm to this conversation. It's uh, it's been a real pleasure. Yeah, mine too. It's nice to uh, to connect with someone. Yeah, that's really nice. Canadian. Canadian. Yeah. Very good, and congratulations again on winning the award. Thank you. Yeah, it's pretty. It's pretty great. I've been speaking with uh, Sydney Smith, who is the author and illustrator of *Small in the City*, which is published in Canada by uh, Anansi, which is the, what the umbrella company to ground. What is it? That's right. House yeah. of Anansi. House of Anansi uh, is the adult. Right is the parent to the the child that is grounded, and uh, throughout the rest of the world, it is. Well, it would be Holiday House in the states, and there's a bunch of other publishers. Uh, there's Korea, Japan, Turkey. Each separate publishers in the separate countries. Yeah, so they England? bought the rights. Through. And England is England is Walker Walker, who's an amazing publisher. Through Walker, I won the Greenaway Award for illustration. Wow. So that's a that was a biggie for me. For um, anyone. For anyone, for sure. But <laughs> uh, not expected. Really, not expected. Kind of blindsided me. And, and that was for. That was for Town Is by the Sea. Okay. Yeah, which, amazingly, had had a very impressive reach in terms of. Just p how people received it, I couldn't believe it because it's a story that's very regional. It's mm. about a small town in, in Cape Breton. It's about it's about it's a story about someone in Cape Breton, which you, you know my prediction was that it wouldn't travel very far, but it traveled all the way to Vietnam. It, uh, or was it Korea? Shit, I'm gonna get in trouble. <laughs> Worldwide. Worldwide. Worldwide, yeah. Places you wouldn't expect. But then places where it does make sense. I mean, you've got, you've got lots of mining communities everywhere. Mm -hmm. yeah. You've got Wales and, and England and Ireland. Communities that are just the same. That all of these communities, which I imagine all feel the same, that they're, they're unique but in, in, a, <laughs> in a, the most uninteresting way. You know, they, mm. they all think that their story is, is not worthy of of sharing but it is that sounds a bit like Alice Munro who talks about the magic of ordinary lives yeah so uh, another Canadian anyway uh, thank you very much again it's been great to talk to you yeah you too my pleasure thank okay. you okay